Great. Well, good morning. Good afternoon. I'm not sure where we are. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Nairi Woods. I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. It's a huge pleasure to chair this session on creating a shared narrative about the future. The word shared means everybody in the room is going to be part of this. So um, we'd like to bring you into this discussion and think about how we can move from the last two days of debating, fearing, hoping um, towards what might be a shared narrative to take away about the fourth industrial revolution um, from this summit. Um, we've got some fantastic panelists here, and I'm going to introduce each of them as I invite them to make some opening comments to you. But I guess our brief this morning is to think about, first, what's already been debated in these rooms this morning, the fractured world that we're living in, where, particularly in this region at the moment, you can feel the tension, the unease about global cooperation in a world where the leadership of global governance is looking slightly less reliable than it's been for some time, and definitely a sense of an accelerating change in global leadership um, with, with China and the United States obviously playing off each other on this. But there's also, at the same time as those global tensions, a collapse in trust in government that we've all been discussing and talking about. It's a collapse in trust that is quite strongly correlated with a slowdown in economic growth. If you look at every country of the world and how much trust in government has collapsed, it's quite closely correlated with what's happened to their growth rate. The problem is, that even if growth picks up, the kind of growth we're seeing now is unlikely to deliver to everyone in those societies. And so it's not actually going to help us get over that trust gap. And then we bring to it the subject of this Global Futures Council Summit, technology, a sector which for a long time through those steady, calm, in retrospect, boring 1990s and 2000s, prided itself on being disruptive. But now, in a very disrupted world, the word disruptive is terrifying to a lot of people. It's terrifying <coughs> to people who are worried they won't have jobs. It's terrifying to people who think that they've lost their children to a virtual reality that they can't control. It's terrifying to governments who are being encouraged to adopt technologies and at the same time being warned of the frightening consequences of inadequate cybersecurity. So, tough times. But we're not here this morning to dwell on those tough times, but rather to think about technology and what kind of positive shared narrative can be built and how as we take forward the fourth industrial revolution. So let me start before coming to our panelists by just asking a few of you who have been leading on the networks this morning for literally the 12 word sentence on the positive vision that you've taken out from your network on each of the 10 elements of the vision 2030. So who here has been, has been leading one of those networks? I'm told that you've been primed. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, just a really short sentence. What, what's the vision? Inspire us. So much to say. Let me just pick up on 12 one words. <laughs> You're counting, yeah. not me. Yeah. Talking about shared narratives, mm. um, and I was in a lot of conversations around agile governance. Mm. One of the things that really resonated with me was that people don't work on intellectual discourse. They work on narrative, on emotion, on feeling, on empathy. And so one of the ideas that came up, which I think really hits a point is the use of art as a mediator in multi-stakeholder dialogue, not so we can reach the end point, but so we begin to diffuse some of the polarization and actually have a valuable discourse around how to move forward with the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so empathy, feelings, sentiments. This is your theme, Tim Dixon, founder of Purpose. 
Tim's first job at age 12 was working for Rupert Murdoch, delivering newspapers, not running um, <laughs> Sky News or anything. Um, Tim, you've founded Purpose. You're trying to deal with the empathy issue in a very fractured Britain at the moment. Can you tell us, tell us about that? Um, so, I, I mean, I think this conversation about the, the power of these disruptive forces um, are a lot of the discussion that we've had in the last couple of days in the, in the um, uh, Future Council I've been in has been around the potentially disruptive power of social systems breaking down. So we talk a lot about technology systems and we live in a world of complex interrelated systems. But if our social systems break down, if polarisation drives us apart, it undermines our capacity to govern, to use technology, etc. So I think that that issue um, becomes of how we, as societies, manage conflict and overcome polarisation. That's the work that we've been doing with More In Common, which is both to understand, from a research point of view, how our societies are tribalising and how social media is playing a role in elevating the, the extremes and leaving uh, a, a gap in the middle and so that the middle, the middle segment of the population often feels lost and adrift between the shouty sides of, of, of different arguments. And we're working on shared narratives to bring those two together. So a research, research element firstly, but also very practical measures. I mean, we saw earlier this year as a very practical example of how we can bring people together. Um, we uh, engineered an, an event called the Great Get Together um, around the, the theme that Britain had had a year of great division, Brexit and, and many other things, um, and an estimated nine million people came out essentially to share food with neighbours and people that they didn't know, demonstrating really that there is this great hunger for connection. Technology, which we thought was going to connect us all, is often dividing us, but there are ways in which we can facilitate connection around shared narratives, and that's the work that we're seeking to do both in Britain, but also Germany, France, United States, we're particularly focusing on how we can bring people together um, rather than allow this polarisation to continue. So your, your campaign is more in common. So what is it that people have in common that you think is the essence of what you're trying to bring out? Well, one of the insights around the, um, the way in which narrative works is when we know narrative is very powerful. So we have, we have an extreme populist narrative that at the level of narrative is having a huge impact on, on our systems and on our politics and so forth around the world. That elevates polarisation conflict. An alternative narrative that is around a common goal that we all share can bring people together. The thing that we have to learn, and this is where, where we've done a lot of research, is that our, our communities, particularly in the Western world, are dividing between the sort of liberal, cosmopolitan, outward-looking, globalist, sort of um, optimistic vision of the future, people who are beneficiaries of change, the nativist, the left behind, that group. Generally, you've got about 25 to 35% in this group, about 15 to 20% in the other, but then you've got about half the population in the middle. Now, the narrative that people like us, the cosmopolitans, often speak, which elevates diversity and difference, actually ends up being quite alienating for people in the middle who are living with a lot of uncertainties. You've mentioned economic change, the rapid pace of cultural demographic change. Uh, also, just the, the sense of division within their own um, societies um, and the role and the fear of the security fears as well. And all of those things are, are elevating people's anxieties. We need shared narratives that don't ignore those anxieties, that don't just talk about difference and diversity but also talk about commonality and our common goals. And that's a big shift, to be talking about what we have in common. Um, and it's not a challenge that's unique either to developed countries. I think that the same issues are being experienced. You can go to Uganda or South Africa or Rwanda's experience, and many other countries, Thailand and Myanmar's experience right now, that finding these ways where we can bring people together, and surprisingly in terms of academic understanding of this, we have a lot of lab laboratory experimentation on what can bring polarised people together, but not a lot of real-world knowledge, and that's where we're going with so really practical... Let's get work. some real-world knowledge. Any other example... Has anyone in the room got an example of this more in common theme, of an, of an attempt in your country, in your community, to bring together 
separated, fractured groups. Has anyone got a concrete example of that? Yes. Uh, by 2030, it would be important that national values and cultural diversity will become integrators and no more worries about uh, growing nationalism or radicalization. You have mentioned security concerns and fear, and it uh, goes very closely together with that. Um, and so we believe that by 2030, mm -hmm. each individual should feel it extremely easy mm -hmm. to have their competencies, their skills, their diploma certificates recognized anywhere in the world. So what, can you give us a concrete example of, of, of one thing that's working to do that? when professional associations agree on um, uh, mutual recognition of their certificates or diplomas, mm -hmm. and it needs to be scaled up. Mm -hmm. So for labor mobility, yeah. right. Great, thank you. Any other e concrete examples behind me? Thank you, point them out. Yes. Uh, yes, so um, an example I would have is my research area is environmental planning. And uh, environmental issues, if they're framed appropriately around quality can bring communities together which might otherwise be fighting with each other. So cooperation over a lake, for example, there's a, you know, a lake which is shared between Albania and uh, some of the other Balkan states, uh, and they have been able to cooperate over that Lake Okrid, uh, which is essentially because of the environment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they don't have much in common in terms of a, a history of violence. Similarly, uh, Ecuador and Peru, they resolved a major territorial dispute in the Cordillera del Condor, which was around territorial issues, but they used the environment and biodiversity to resolve it. But it has to be framed properly. If you frame it as a divisive quantity issue, it can lead to conflict, but if you frame it around quality, it leads to work. Thank you. So Tim Dixon began by saying, technology can separate and fracture societies but we've seen some examples of where it can also bring people together. Can I just ask you for a little vote, a little show of hands, how many of you think that on balance, technology will fracture your society and separate it? That's option A, and option B is how many of you think that technology will help your, your community or society come together on balance? Clearly it can do both. You've got to go vote one way or the other. So, fracture and separate your society. Who thinks technology will do that? Okay, and who thinks technology will help bring your society together and help it cooperate? Okay, so there's a, there's a slight majority, I think, in favor of bringing society together. Okay, so we're off to a positive narrative this morning. Um, this, is, this, is, this is good news, I think. I'd like to now come to shift our pace slightly to Nita Farahani. Nita is a professor um, at Duke University, but has launched SciPol, um, in order to help normal citizens like the rest of us better understand science and technology policy. Um, Nita, you're working on neurotechnology. Um, it's a bit frightening to the rest of us. You know, will the government know what's going on in our brain? Right. C can they? Where are we on this? Well, so to be clear, I work on the legal and ethical issues with respect to neurotechnology um, and, uh, and, and more broadly, a number of emerging technologies. Um, I'll tell you kind of a, a funny story first, which is on the plane ride over here, I finally was able to indulge in watching a movie. And I chose a movie that I hadn't heard of before, but that was quite interesting called Circle. Um, and if you haven't seen it, uh, it was you know, interesting for, for the point that I want to make, which is um, it was about uh, sort of what happens in a world of, of total transparency. What happens when um, information about us is shared ubiquitously and we might choose to share that information about ourselves ubiquitously and uh, kind of follow our every move. Um, and, one, and the reason that was so interesting to me is one area that I think um, we're all a little bit concerned about is the fact that there's so much information that's being collected about us. It's really ubiquitous. And in the wrong hands, we're unsure of what that's going to mean for our future. Uh, what does that mean for our relationship with one another? What does that mean for um, misuse of information against us? Um, and in neurotechnologies uh, that I study, I think this point is really brought to a, a kind of sharp um, example of that. So uh, a, a, a number of people probably here, do any of you wear fitness tracker devices? Anybody have anything on that is a tracker? a number of you, mm -hmm. um, and you choose to do that because it's convenient and it also tells you something about yourself, right? Uh, well, 
There are new such technologies that are emerging every day. It's a burgeoning market, and one of those areas is in neurotechnologies. There are these simple consumer-based devices, EEG devices, electroencephalography that track brain waves. Um, and there's a lot that you could do with that. You could learn about how to focus better, how to meditate better. Um, some people are starting in the corporate world to ask of their corporate employees who are, or require of their corporate employees who are on the factory floor to wear these devices in order to find out whether or not they are focused and alert. Um, truck drivers are being asked to wear these uh, in order to track whether or not they're drowsy while driving because drowsiness while driving is one of the, it's the number one cause of accidents in the world. So there's some wonderful advantages to these technologies. We could decrease accidents, we could decrease accidents on the factory floor, but what else can you learn from these devices. Could you, for example, start to decode a lot of information from the brain? Well, advances in other areas of neuro neurotechnology suggest you can recreate visual images that you see in your brain. A recent study that came out this summer was able to reconstruct, not through EEG, through a different technology, the sentences and thoughts people were thinking in their brain. And that's amazing progress. We can learn so much about the human condition through those. But what happens when your simple fitness tracker device or your EEG that you're voluntarily wearing starts to reconstruct the visual images in your brain and starts to reconstruct your thoughts? Mm -hmm. And what happens when that information has no protection for you as an individual? Can you think a dissident political thought without persecution? Can you uh, start to suffer cognitive decline without your employer firing you? And governments have an important role to play in this because there is no minimum threshold for privacy. There is no protection of this last bastion of freedom, your brain. And unless we start to engage in a pretty serious dialogue, individuals with governments about what a minimum floor of protection should look like, what a minimum amount of privacy in your brain or in your life in general should look like, our future is going to look very different than it does so today. So hold, hold that thought. How many of you would be comfortable to wear a brain tracking device? After Hands that, up. Right? <laughs> Hands up. Nobody. Not anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. How many of you? There's one. There's one over there. <laughs> how many of you, although you wouldn't wear one yourself, would like to put one on your spouse or your employees? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we've got some honest folk there, right? Okay. I'd love to put them on my students to see whether they're paying attention and then just zap <laughs> them when they're not. There right? you go. <laughs> okay, so Nita, what's the, what's the, uh, tell us the positive narrative. Well, so, so the upside is, I mean, take it from the genetic side of mm -hmm. things, right? People had the same fear before, which is if you start to share your genetic information, it could be misused against you. But if we don't share, we won't learn the tremendous number of things that we could, for example, for precision medicine and genetics to enable us to be able to learn great things about the human condition, ways to treat diseases, ways to treat mental illnesses and other conditions. And so I think we have to create an environment in which people want to share their information in order to make advances, in order to learn about ourselves, in order to enable us to be able to make the progress that technology will enable us to make. But we can only do so if we engage in a positive dialogue to figure out what is the minimum amount of protection? What is the nature of the misuse we're concerned about? How do we create an environment in which people are comfortable wearing these devices because they know that there is some way that they can wear it and enjoy the benefits without suffering from significant downsides from misuse of collection of information about them? How do you turn on and off what information is shared about you. But that dialogue has to turn into some quite robust regulation. And it needs to turn into, I think, an adaptive form of regulation, right? One thing in this new economy is that technology is proceeding so quickly mm. that stifling regulation will prevent progress from happening. But a lack of regulation also doesn't work. And so a new yep. model is an adaptive regulation model, which doesn't seek to over-regulate but seeks to put into place some minimum protections and then as technology develops, enables for adaption to occur over time. And do you personally think that in five years time you will trust the regulatory regime enough to wear the device yourself? I'm in an insulated position in society, right? I'm a tenured professor. Mm -hmm. I have protections that mean that I could wear one of those. Mm -hmm. Would I recommend my child wear one mm -hmm. of those or my spouse who doesn't have that mm -hmm. same kind of protection five years from now wear one of those? No. 
Mm -hmm. Me personally, would I, would I wear it? Mm -hmm. Yes, and so the question is how do we take the kind of privileged position mm -hmm. that I'm in, mm -hmm. right, in a protected mm -hmm. employment setting where mm -hmm. a lot of the benefits that I need to be able to flourish in society are secured for me, yeah. and ensure other people enjoy similar mm -hmm. kinds of securities to be able to adopt technologies, mm -hmm. enjoy the benefits of technology without mm -hmm. facing and exposing themselves to significant mm -hmm. risks. So can I turn back again to the audience to ask, did any of you come up with an actionable way to create regulation that people will trust enough to step into this quite scary, otherwise, technology? Did anyone, do we have anyone that's come up with, yes? So we are a neuroscience. And here's the microphone. Okay, so. Some of us here are on neuroscience, neurotechnology panel. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we'd like to invite you to come to our meeting at mm -hmm. we'll noon you. so that we mm -hmm. discuss exactly this mm -hmm. and related topic. So very, one quick point is that there is a certain over expectation and hype about mm -hmm. this whole topic of reading the mind or reverse engineering the brain mm -hmm. and so on. So of course, we can get carried away. So the, the example you gave is a highly constrained MRI images where fixed set of things are given and they can reverse read what that is, which is far from reading the mind. So we have a lot of, we have time. I mean, that doesn't mean your work is not important. It is really important. So I don't think that our issue right now is this kind of scare and hype and mind will be read and so on. But I'm not sure the issue, the question you're asking, mm -hmm. regulation mm -hmm. is at this time. Mm -hmm. It's really, we are more at a very technology enabling stage. It's really the ethics, probably exactly what you're studying. What is the right topic to study? What's the right way to study, right way to engage, whether your yeah. spouse or your son, as you put mm -hmm. it. And once the ethics and social aspects mm -hmm. of are understood, mm -hmm. then we can talk about regulation, which can, both be stifling as well as perhaps human safety. But what would you say to reassure the factory worker who's being, who says, look, every part of my day is now being tracked by my employer. This feels like indentured labor. What would you say to the factory worker that's being asked to wear a brain okay, device? Well, hold on. I think if with a video camera, they're being tracked a lot more or mm -hmm. a Fitbit or mm -hmm. a various keystrokes that mm -hmm. they're putting on the computer. So that's mm -hmm. probably, or Facebook, mm -hmm. it's far, far more intrusive mm -hmm. than perception that we are somehow ability to monitor 100 billion brain cells with mm -hmm. puntillion mm -hmm. synapses, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we are almost too far from thinking as if mm -hmm. like somehow factory workers' mind will be read mm -hmm. and it will be intruded. We have mm -hmm. many checks and balances before that, mm -hmm. camera tracking, mm -hmm. um, even emotion tracking, right? You can put a skin conductor and galvanic skin response, which will track your emotional level. So are you suicidal or not, or lying or not? Mm -hmm. So there are many procedures that are coming before we will go to the brain, and they can serve as benchmark. And I would applaud the kind of work you would do so that we can figure out the ethics, then the social norms, which will vary from country and to country and society to society. Mm -hmm. And then comes, I think, in inevitably regulation. And that prematurely under scaremongering will stifle everything good thing we are likely to do. Also, for audience, as an example, you probably know, deep brain stimulation treats mm. Parkinson's. Mm. It's an incredible treatment. Mm. However, you are stimulating the brain already very effectively. Mm. Now, had that been, oh, I'm putting an electrode in the brain to stimulate the brain, would instantly arouse paranoia that, oh my God, somebody's controlling my mind because okay. I, I can hi hack that stimulator. So Thank you. So I think we'll stop, we'll stop there. That was great. Um, we're all, one, we're one all so one. monitored anyway, we shouldn't worry about our brains. What do you think, Nita? <laughs> Just one quick thing. One is 100% um, agree EEG cannot read your thoughts or your vi images mm -hmm. in your brain yet. It already is being used for simple tracking. Mm -hmm. And it's true that it's just an example of the ubiquitous information that's being collected about individuals in society today from video cameras to every other kind of biometric sensor to many other things. The point, I think, is not about EEG. The point is about a minimum floor of privacy mm -hmm. and adopting and recognizing that the conversation, positive conversation that we need to have is what is the nature of the minimum threshold of privacy that governments and individuals can work together to achieve 
so that we can enjoy the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution without fear of participating in that economy. Right. And in the development of those technologies and then the governance of them, the world is going to need a lot of cooperation. Um, Leslie Marsdorp, you're, you've been part of building a new institute, institution of global governance in Shanghai. Um, with all the challenges that come with trying to build a new institution, which isn't based on the, on the global powers that be, but rather on, on the BRICS. Does it make you hopeful that in responding to this challenge, which will affect all countries, we can build new institutions for cooperation across borders? I mean, I'd say over the last two days, we've heard a great deal about the acceleration of technology and how that is changing uh, our world. Uh, the question you've just posed to me now is about have our institutions adapted or are they adapting to this changing uh, world? Um, in terms of global uh, governance, I would argue that the rules of the game have pretty much remained the same for the last 70 years uh, since the post-World War kind of consensus, if I want to call it that. We see now today the emergence of new types of institutions, and I think the BRICS is one little experiment, one little laboratory symbolizing that uh, change. Let me give you an example why I say that. For the first time now, you have an international institution, the New Development Bank, which is linked to the BRICS countries, where five very different countries of diverse uh, size and, and economic and political uh, influence have equal say in the running of the institution. China, as you know, is an $11 trillion economy, second biggest economy in the world. It has exactly the same say in the running of this institution as Brazil, as South Africa, which, by the way, is 30 times, uh, China's 32 times bigger than South Africa. So our institutions, the rules of the game needs to be redefined to see what is required, not just for today, but for the next uh, 20 years. This is still an experiment. I'm sure there will be significant challenges over the next uh, uh, couple of years and decades uh, to come, how this will actually work in practice. But the key point is this, that there is no veto power associated with this dominant China. Um, if you configure how the world looked after 1945, when the US was 50% of the world economy, almost every uh, do leading institution was dominated by the United States. We could see laboratories emerging in other spheres of governance that replicates this model. But I mean, it, it, the BRICS bank you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, was born at a time when it was revolutionary for those countries to create their own development bank and tell other organizations to take a walk, in a way, right? That was a sort of slightly revolutionary act when it was born. But now it looks rather establishment. I mean, China now is at the center, to quote President Xi, of global governance. Does it, does it feel that way? Do you now feel a very conventional part of global institutions? Or is there something in the new development bank that is slightly disruptive, that is a different model of cooperation, that could help bring trust to countries who perhaps don't necessarily trust the, the largest powers in the world? I think there has been or there is undergoing a fundamental change in global governance and in broad terms it's got to do with the rise of emerging markets and the growing political and economic influence of China right at the center of that. So this bank is an example, is an expression of that greater uh, sort of uh, posture by, by China and the emerging markets in uh, the globe. However, it is still early days. I think you also hinted at the fact that the emerging markets framework and the context have changed quite dramatically since the bank was formed. Many of these countries today are experiencing very deep political and economic crises. However, the institution was set up for the long term. So this is about the next 20, 30, 40 years. One shouldn't subject the institution through the lenses of the last two years and you know, look at the crisis in Brazil or South Africa and say, you know, will these be significant powers going uh, forward? The next uh, important point I would say is that there is one global uh, system. It's obviously different uh, features to, to the system, but China operates as much as, as, much as this, it describes itself as a socialist economy with Chinese characteristics. It operates within a market uh, system. And in no way is the New Development Bank trying to uh, build an alternate competing uh, system. It's trying to entrench and build in characteristics 
of a new model of uh, uh, governance, which is not premised on the dominance of uh, the, the great powers of the world. Mm -hmm. So that's one experiment, a, a reasonably conventional experiment in how we should cooperate. Um, are there any others in this room? Experiments in global cooperation. I mean, we've all heard this morning already that the great opportunity of new technology and the huge fears about what happens if there isn't cooperation? What happens if it falls into the hands of those who we know will misuse it, who we know will use it to oppress or to torture or to do bad things? That's why we need global cooperation. So a couple of examples of experiments in global cooperation that work. Yes. Hi, I'm Arunama Ghosh. I run the Council on Energy, Environment and Water in India. Uh, on the 30th of November 2015, France and India came forward and announced a new initiative called the International Solar Alliance. On the 6th of December this year, uh, the ISA will become uh, the world's newest intergovernmental organization. Mm -hmm. But why is it different? Number one, it's a developed and a developing country coming forward and kicking off a new initiative. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's not meant to be another big international bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. The very lean secretariat, mm -hmm. it's meant to be a platform for the private sector and the public sector and civil society to come together to do things which would be faster, cheaper, and ways that have not been imagined before. And is China not a member? China is meant to be uh, a going, is like to become a signatory to the framework agreement. Uh, Australia has signed up. Um, you have uh, the latest ratifier of the framework agreement is Guinea. So you've got a range of countries coming forward and seeing that the technology exists, the finance exists, the market exists in its potential, but you don't have platforms that bring it all together. Yeah. And, and what you need nimble, yeah. agile right. institutions to but do that. But what exactly will the alliance do? Number one, it's meant to de-risk and reduce the cost of capital for deploying technologies in, in the solar and renewable space, which currently is not being deployed in the countries where the sun shines. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number two, collaborate and pool and resources for R&D for next generation of technology. Great, thank you. What about does anyone have an example of global cooperation which addresses directly um, the governance of technology, the governance of the technologies which, which people are a bit worried about? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm on the, uh, the Council for Human Rights, the Future of Human mm. Rights, um, and I'm, I'm not an expert in human rights myself, but I'm increasingly seeing the value of the ultimate um, global... Um, cooperative venture, which is the Universal Declaration signed by 193 countries, as the basis for a discussion and debate before regulation about the, 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 the value of the individual, the rights of indi the individual, and the use of technologies and their impact on the individual. Mm -hmm. So I think I would urge all those involved in those technologies, that is a great place to start. And it's the only globally agreed framework of values and expression of rights for individual people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Espen. I think one, one example, uh, Espen Bartadi from the International Security Council, one example narrates uh, the embryonic discussions at the UN about lethal autonomous weapon systems, which is about trying to find a way to interact with a very growing, fast growing tide of, uh, of technologies where the kill decision can be made by a machine, by a logarithm rather than a human being, mm -hmm. and whether that should be regulated, prohibited, or in some, some way controlled before it's sort of really here. And, uh, and it's a challenging discussion because you're running after a technology that is more advanced than the diplomatic <laughs> discussion about it, but it's the one attempt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe in the back. Yeah, so I'm in the in the board of the Partnership on AI, which is an initiative uh, putting together corporate and non-corporate uh, entities mm -hmm. to discuss and share best practices about developing the technology and deploying it in the real world and understanding the impact that it has on people and society with the idea of maximizing the possible you know, benefits mm -hmm. on people and society. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a very multi-stakeholder initiative. It was started by, an, a year ago by six companies, the six uh, sorry, I didn't catch which technology. AI. AI, yes. sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was started by six uh, companies, the main mm -hmm. players mm -hmm. in uh, developing AI. 
is mm -hmm. Google, Apple, mm -hmm. uh, IBM, mm -hmm. Facebook, Microsoft, mm -hmm. and Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we have 54 partners. Mm -hmm. Uh, of which only, you know, about half and half, corporate and non-corporate, mm -hmm. you know, discussing together about the main topics and the main issues that are in deploying AVI in the real world. And again, just like the BRICS, this is wants to achieve a balance mm -hmm. and where everybody, nobody has a veto about the initiative and the outcomes that come out. Uh, even the board, even though it was started by six companies, the board had six representatives from the founding members, but mm -hmm. also six people from non-corporate environments, mm -hmm. NGOs, civil society, academia, and so on. So I think that that's a very, to me, it's a very promising uh, experiment uh, in understanding the impact of the mm -hmm. technology and also in contributing to a positive mm -hmm. narrative, mm -hmm. shared narrative. Great, well, let me, let me pose to you all the question then. You will, pretty much everyone in the room was unwilling to wear the brain device, okay, given we'll take the limitations. We're in the hypothetical world at the moment, okay. Um, but you've now got a choice of trusting either corporate self-regulation, because a lot of companies are saying if we let governments get their hands on this, the innovations just won't happen. It's going to slow down innovations which could be life-saving. So this model of corporations with civil society groups in dialogue is model A. Model B is the other one that people are proposing, which is that it's got to be governments because otherwise um, the public interest won't be fully protected because it'll always be traded off against the corporate interest. So which, which one are you going to, which one would you, would you want to see, um, which one would you trust more? So first, corporate and NGO, corporate and society, the alliance we just heard about. No hands at all? Oh, yeah. OK. So we've got some. some. OK. Just hand up. Thank you. And what about government and intergovernmental? OK. So there's a sort of majority on the, on the government and intergovernmental. Um, let's move now to how it is that what's being done is communicated. So we started this morning with this huge trust gap. and. Um, what goes on even in these discussions in the Global Futures Summit, of course, reaches relatively few people. So we're, we're very lucky to have Mina Al-Orabi here today, editor-in-chief of, of the United Arab Emirates main newspaper, main English language newspaper, the National. Um, Mina, you're in the business of communicating um, to the wider population. Um, can we rely on you? to take the comforting, positive narrative <laughs> that we might extract from this room and, and to communicate it to people or not? Well, in terms of responsibility, of course, and that's what we're in the business for. But the problem is today, you will have someone share a screen grab of a tweet through WhatsApp to a group of people all over the world and say, I've just received this news. And you don't know where, whether that tweet is actually right or it's been photoshopped. You don't know if it's a verified account. You don't know where the screen grab came from. You don't know if it was forwarded to that person. So even if you trust that particular person, you don't know where they got it from. So the problem today is that we have all this fragmentation, but also we, each of us, today is a publisher and a distributor of news. And we use the word media, and we say, well, is the responsibility of the media, where really the word is no longer in itself, the term in itself, is no longer reliable, because it's across the board in terms of media. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, know, you have terms of legacy media, traditional media, newspapers, who today are trying to find a space for themselves of what does it mean to be a newspaper or a traditional media outlet, whether it's television or radio, um, amongst all this information that's being disseminated, mm -hmm. and misinformation, fake news. Many of us have read all the articles and listened to the stories of fake news, and it's, it is a big challenge. Added to it is, of course, the technology, not only in terms of publication and dissemination, but also who's controlling the search engine results. You know, everybody now in the media world has to think of search engine optimization. So how are we writing the headline in order to grab your attention to read it at the national, not to read it at my competitors. Add to it money. 
we've hardly spoken about money. When we're talking about, is it corporations who are controlling AI or government, one of the issues at play here is money. And there's billions of dollars at stake in terms of who can control the algorithm that decides if a single topic is trending on Facebook. And then we get the pressure from advertisers of how many eyeballs are on your page at any given time and how long are they spending there and what's actually impacting that. And so you can rely, yes, on us to do the traditional journalism of reporting and quoting accurately and if it's inaccurate, you can write a letter to the editor which we will publish and amend and so forth, but that is becoming drowned out amongst everything else that we're all communicating via device that's constantly on us. And so I think one of the issues here is this, whose responsibility is it? And a great part today, the responsibility and the onus is on each of us who have the control to publish and disseminate. And just saying, I just received this, can't verify it, but here you go, is not good enough. And we've seen how potent that can be. But there's, when you say it's on each of us individually, that feels slightly hopeless to, to most of us, right? Because there's this huge tide out there that you're swimming against. And surely, in the past, we've, there are clear rules about what publishers can publish. Yeah. Are the technology companies who are in the business of disseminating the messages, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, are they actually publishers? Would you say they're publishers, or would you say they're they technology don't. companies? I, uh, to me, I see them also as publishers. Mm -hmm. Because today, you can go live from any of these um, websites or platforms but also they are learning and we are learning as media companies and the World Economic Forum has been instrumental in this and in actually bringing together representatives of whether it's Google or Facebook, Twitter and others and members of the International Media Council here at the World Economic Forum and that's why it's been such a strong convening power to actually sit and have these conversations. They weren't happening four or five years ago. They were probably not even happening three years ago. And so we're learning of how we take back the responsibility and you're right, of course it's not just each individual of you and their responsibilities on us and on them of what's being shared. Um, you know, we're sitting so, here so, and... So, so if a Russian bot produces mm -hmm. a defamatory message and that's yes. published across Facebook, mm -hmm. no one can do anything about it. But if you publish that message, you can have a suit, a defamation suit brought against yes. you, I assume. We can have a defamation suit and also there is an address. There's someone you can come to. We have to give you know, on our About Us page, who we are and how you can contact us. And that's not necessarily the case if it's a bot. Now, there are being increased pressures on actually verifying whether this is a human or a bot. And I think as we're seeing, and this is one of the positive messages, let's say, as we're seeing these concerns rise and rise and people raising these issues, companies, and the tech giants actually taking on the responsibility of making sure, first of all, this is a human being, and where are they coming from? But it's, it's very difficult. I mean, we saw this particular issue when it came to the use by extremists and terrorists of social media to get their messages out. So what, what do you do as a newspaper? What you're depicting sounds like a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Because sadly, our eyeballs are often attracted by not by our elevated selves, but you know, by the most salacious gossip you know, around, right? So there's a kind of dragging down to the very sort of baser parts of human nature. So how do you as a newspaper fight against that? Well, there's, there's still the traditional and elevated standards of journalism in terms of making sure you're double sourcing, making sure that you're going to the people concerned, but also, in addition to that, making sure that you talk about the positive, but also the, the good aspects of what's going on. So I'll give you an example. We've just had the Louvre Abu Dhabi open. It was mm -hmm. the biggest story. It was by far the widest, most read articles, videos that we shared and photos because people wanted to see that good news story and also a sense of achievements and accomplishment. So if we go to the issue of shared narratives, we do find that actually people want to go to a well-written story that is positive, that does give you hope, that frames a particular issue or, for example, on the Middle East, telling people things about the Middle East beyond the doom and destruction. But we also have a responsibility to talk about the destruction, the fact of the voiceless people who will never really be in a hole like this and mm -hmm. have their story be told. So we still have that responsibility, 
but we have also the responsibility not to be as cynical and say that there can be good news stories that we can share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we heard at the beginning of this session why we need a kind of shared narrative. Fractured societies, we need to find what we have more in common with one another. And then we heard about how technologies do present opportunities and things we should be afraid of, and we need adaptive governance systems. We heard about the kinds of new institutions we might need to take that governance forward, and now about how it is that, if it's a narrative we're looking for, how do we communicate that narrative? So Mina's given us a view, sitting as editor of a major newspaper, about how we communicate the narrative. Who else in the room has some ideas, proposals, concrete suggestions about how we communicate a narrative? Yep. Um, I think as a dominant species on this planet, we are a culpable in being very anthropocentric. But in being human-centered, we are not being human-centered. We recognize that in the longer time frame, our well-being is deeply coupled with other planetary systems. So perhaps a larger goal, a much more enduring goal, mm -hmm. might be uh, a concept uh, that was developed by Professor Pam Matson in Stanford University called multi-generational well-being. Mm -hmm. Because if you have well-being that is not just about the crisis mm -hmm. that is impending or, or, go, or ongoing, mm -hmm. but also deals with humans around the curvature of time, not just the planet, mm -hmm. then you have to take into account the broader perspective, and it's, it's a multi-temporal frame. Okay, th thank you, but let's, let's focus in on some concrete ways that you communicate a narrative, given that even established newspapers are being dragged down. Yeah, here in the front row, we've got two, two um, ideas. I, first of all, I echo everything you said. I'm, I'm chairing the Media Information uh, Council here. And yesterday that we were jumping around different councils, what I've heard from the food and energy is they both have a communication challenge because they would like the world to know better about the future of energy or, or the future of food and agriculture. So I, I believe, and, and, and we were struggling as, as media owners around the world because it's less economically viable to do media. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're, we're betting on the humanity being hopeful. Mm -hmm. So they want to hear about the better world. We just need to make sure that what, what every technology or every industry or every country that we're betting on for the future, we build around a very positive and hopeful narrative and we're relentless about communicating this via the new media vehicles that, that both youth and older people are using in, in digital because we want a better world as human beings. Okay, so when you say we're betting on humanity being hopeful, does that mean you're betting on humans stopping opening those messages which are hateful? Or can you just elaborate? What does yes. it mean to bet on uh, humanity being hopeful? Let me go to both sides of this equation because they're interesting. First, uh, yeah, we do have fake news and we have all these things that are, they, they're much more attractive than general news and we know that and we suffer that as media people. It's much more interesting to read something that is fake mm -hmm. and it was made up to entertain mm -hmm. than that today something's going on with some arrest and, and your local town. So we deal with that uh, and, and through time we'll leave that people will stop opening those messages because it just won't be right. Mm -hmm. And we will get educated as a society, as more literacy we gain in digital, that reading and sharing that is just not correct. Mm -hmm. So we, we would foresee, since last year we did in the GFC, a, a decline on the consumption of fake news and, and that kind of crap content, if I may. Uh, on the other Let, side let's of just, Let's just hold that for one second. Who's going to bet with this yeah, gentleman on the hu hopefulness of humanity? Hands up. Who's going to bet on the hopefulness of you? We'll, I'll come to you in a sec. Right. Great. So, okay. So you've got some support losing, here right? on betting on humanity. <laughs> I'm losing badly. Can I come to the lady who's got a response to you? Thank you so much. I'm Veronica Nyan Jones with the IFC on the Long-Term Investment and Infrastructure mm -hmm. Council. And we had an idea that was more about quality to support positive information sharing. And we're concerned that, you know, the narrative for us really engages a lot more young people who are desperate to connect. We thought, could we form some, could we hire many young people sort of Peace Corps style 
to be the ones to monitor and support cybersecurity and resilience, to ensure that both the there's a watchfulness of, for malware out there, but also in terms of civic discourse, that there are people, young people, keeping an eye out for what the messages are being shared and whether or not they're legitimate or not. A Peace Corps of young people to, to help you monitor, does that sound helpful to you? In, in some way, because <laughs> the other side of the same equation we're talking about, it's the new way of communicating to the youth. Mm -hmm. It's not a long test with investigative mm -hmm. journalism that has 10,000 words that are pretty good, mm -hmm. but they need just a snapshot. Mm -hmm. it, maybe it's an Instagram picture that describes a narrative, mm -hmm. and that's the way they're consuming the new information. Mm -hmm. So we need to adapt the message to a new generation that has 10 seconds for you. And we need to be able to portray your messages in such new formats. Thank you very much. Did you have a, a thought too? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, with the uh, Human Rights Council, and we've been talking the last couple of days also about the ubiquitous nature of information. I want to come back to what was said a little bit ago about sort of multi-stakeholder efforts. And they are existing in many areas. But in this area, the relationship between traditional media and the new platforms there really hasn't been that kind of a bring, coming together. And one of the things I think the WEF can do is to bring together, to create a multi-stakeholder conversation about rules of the road for dealing with things like disinformation, for accuracy, issues of sources of information. There's a key issue here unresolved, and I think there's really a moment in time where it shouldn't be governments regulating content, but we've got to find alternative ways, and the internet platforms need to be in the center of that discussion with others. I think WEF can be a convenient. So you're saying Facebook and Twitter should have rules of the road? Absolutely, but they shouldn't be the only ones deciding them. There right. needs to be an intern There needs to be yeah. a discussion with various parties. And who would enforce these rules of the road? Well, I think there, there are examples in other areas of human rights that I know where you've cre organizations have been created that set standards, metrics, and ways of evaluating that aren't just the companies, but others coming to the table to do the same thing. But first, we've got to have the discussion. And I think, again, the WEF can be a place to convene that discussion. Great. Thank you. We had a comment back here. Yeah, I'll come to you. I, I wanted to go back to the point about how to um, better uh, communicate and, and, and to form a shared narrative. And this is also a response a little bit to the, the like kids don't read thing. Um, I think that there's a, a better way to frame it, which is uh, I think people across the board can communicate better if they respect readers' time and meet them where they are. Um, and I'll leave it at that in respect for your time. So I think that was a call for any report from any of your councils to be one paragraph long. <laughs> right. Okay, so there's a challenge for everybody. So can we have the microphone here? Thank and by you. the way, sorry, to the gentleman who said the one paragraph long, I mean, wasn't he a brilliant example of what he just advocated? <laughs> the pressure's on you now. Indeed. Uh, Vijay Punasami from the Mobility Council. I experienced a couple of days ago, perhaps the most beautiful, inspiring, and for those who do not know Abu Dhabi, surprising uh, experience of celebrating common causes. Mm -hmm. It was a visit of the Abu Dhabi Louvre. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. the way they have actually brought together mm -hmm. art across civilizations, celebrating each one of them, is probably the most beautiful way you can actually get inspired. And the way they're seeking out to bring children into the museum is also quite inspiring. The most telling, perhaps, room was the room celebrating religions, mm -hmm. where you had historical books mm -hmm. from the Torah, mm -hmm. from the Bible, mm -hmm. from the Quran, mm -hmm. from Buddhist and Hindu uh, scriptures, all in one room. Mm -hmm. Tells more than millions of books. And so I encourage each one of you not only to visit that museum, but encourage others to do so. But there's so more you can do by sharing those common values. Thank you. So it's another theme that's been coming out. The public spaces, art, music, um, the ways that humans remind each other that they have things in, in common. Um, Stuart, you had a point. I'm going to come back. Yes, Stuart Wallace from the Values Council. Um, what history shows us is that when you're looking at systemic change, and we're clearly in that moment now, what's critical is you get a vanguard of people who know things are wrong and want to do something about it, prepared to act. 
acting together. And so one of the things that I'm involved in with a whole group of other people is creating something called We All, or the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which is groups of countries, cities, um, people across the globe who know, want to actually change and come up with a different system, come up with a new narrative. So the critical thing is how we work together, whether it's in WEF, whether it's a, a youth peace corps, or other ways of doing it. But we've got to get that 10% who know things are wrong and want to do something about it, working together. Common cause. Can I, can I ask Stuart? Yes. Just to, for our council, Stuart, sorry. Uh, right, don't, don't give that away. I want Stuart to just follow for, for a moment, which is um, one of the things that I think is really helpful for the conversation about the narrative is a conversation we had last night that maybe Stuart could talk a little bit about the project that he's working on uh, within the council about a new social contract, right? Because one um, way that I think a lot of these things tie together in the fourth industrial revolution is a new social contract, which is really people plus governments plus all of these institutions. And the project you're working on is really speaks to that. Would you share just a, a couple us, sentences? Why, one sentence? why not just give us one concrete element of a new social contract? One concrete element of new social contract is what's happening with the G20 mm -hmm. and the work of Dennis Snower and others, mm -hmm. where there's serious pressure being put on the G20 now to not just look at the economic, but look at the social, because economic and social progress are part of company. And that's concrete um, lobbying that's gone on by lots of think tanks across the world, mm -hmm. and it's happening, and it's on the agenda for Argentina for the next um, G20 meeting. Brilliant. Thank you. You, sir. Yes, hello. I'm Thomas Sermacor. I'm a futurist. I work with the X Prize and advise a couple across GFC in initiatives here. Mm -hmm. I just want to offer a point of view on the word communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're, we're slightly misunderstanding the generations that are coming after us, uh, partly because they don't necessarily feel that they can own the conversation. Mm -hmm. and so they're still talked at, and they're being offered platforms to be talked at. Mm -hmm. and I think this is the main thing. They need, the reason why you know, we try to think our way into the minds of youth and actually it's not that they have a short attention span is it that they want to feel that they co-create mm -hmm. that's the thing that we're robbing them from because a lot of the platforms are actually not genuine so i think that the main thing that needs to be solved and that mm -hmm. where the WEF can help mm -hmm. if it really understands the dna of the fourth industrial revolution and how the next generation will be involved it has to do with the ownership or the sense of ownership so a lot of the work i've done has to do with co-creation and co-curation, et cetera. And I think that's where we're not exactly doing the right thing. To make it very simple, if children, if youth, if the next generation feels that it has, a bit like Wikipedia, an opportunity to moderate the conversation and not just listen, I think it would change a lot. Mina, when you hear that, co-creation, how does that strike you? I mean, you're, you're editor-in-chief of a newspaper. Can you reach out to Emirati youth and have them co-create with you? What, is, what does that mean? Well, I think there is something to be said about expertise, media literacy. I mean, I think part of our problem is that we're often not going back to the very basics of what's primary sourcing, secondary sourcing, how you actually are also reading media. But in terms of co-creating, I think there are actually more opportunities today than there have ever been to share, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, which are huge in this part of the world. And so actually they're having the platforms, but the idea is, is there a disconnect between a newspaper and who's reading the newspaper? And we're trying to combat that by being available on the platforms of where they will read. And so I would say it's, it's also, there is, I think, a moment to also step back and say, you have to appreciate that it takes time and expertise and experience, and we're willing to do that. So in terms of having interns, we've had recently um, undergraduates come and visit the newsroom and have conversations. We go to schools and speak with them. So in that sense of a conversation and hearing from them what interests them, but also learning that it's not so much attention span, but video. I mean, we can create video now in ways that never used to happen before, and that is more appealing to people across the board. Part of it is also sharing content and giving the ability to share content so people feel that they're part of the conversation. But I would say in terms of co-creating, or co-writing articles, there is still a method to the madness that needs to be learned. Did, did you have any advice for the newspaper editors in the room? Yeah, actually, my, my comment was not directed as a newspaper. Uh, yeah. And I fully agree with what you've said. You know, mm. the platforms exist more than ever, uh, as a matter of fact, as you just mm. said. I think it's the connection point between the newsroom, uh, you know, governments and the institutions that we are familiar with and this co-creation environment that is failing. So, you know, it's not that we don't have the tools, it's not that people don't want to listen, but we're not making the point of connect. 
So some examples of these, I think, are around data commons and the uh, ability to express this. You know, Wikipedia is a great example, obviously. Uh, I worked with the, the G7 to try and set up a, an AI framework for good as one of the experts. And it, these are just some of the pathways that we need to adopt in order to, to make that link. Right now, it's mm -hmm. non-existent, mm -hmm. and I think it's non-existent in many of the institutions that we're talking about. Can Thank I, you. So, so get back just briefly, very yeah. briefly on that. I mean, one of the things about the UAE, for example, they have a youth minister that's done youth circles that go to all the different Emirates and actually have very similar setting like this, where young people speak. The National Media Council has a youth national media council now. So there is an engagement in, in certain countries that you can learn from where it's these conversations and you're including young people not as either listen to or we're going to talk about young youth issues, but talking about all the key issues we're talking about, but by a younger generation. So I do think there are some lessons to be learned. Thank you. Uh, no, can, can we bring the microphone to our Emirati colleague? Yes, sir. Actually, I'm from Saudi Arabia. Ah. So I'm a member of the, um, um, the Global Council on the Future of uh, Information and Entertainment. So I would like to come from a different angle, from technology point of view. Mm -hmm. Fake news have always existed in the human history. Mm -hmm. It's called gossip, it's called propaganda. They have always existed. But what's the solution for it is create credibility platforms, which are like uh, licensed or regulated media outlets, whether state-owned or uh, uh, privately owned. With the internet, the dissemination became instantaneous mm -hmm. and became at mass and became at global. Mm -hmm. So the speed and the reach of the information became much more, uh, fa much more, like, became faster and uh, more instantaneous than the credibility platforms that we have now, which is the traditional media. So the only way for um, fake news impact to be reduced and the real news impact come up front is technology to play a role to accelerate or change how credibility tools or credibility platforms are being run. Like for example, blockchain can help a lot in mm -hmm. putting a credibility angle mm -hmm. at the same speed of the dissemination mm -hmm. of the information by using, using the internet. So Thank this you. is a technology angle, but also could imply business model changes. <coughs> Newspaper relying on newsrooms, two editors checking, double checking, cross checking is not enough with the way it is being done now. Mm -hmm. They have to change. Thank you. A really important reminder that technology itself, whether it's blockchain or other, can actually help us create assurance in the system um, as, we, as we create this shared narrative. I'd like to just come, we've got just a few minutes, back to our panelists to ask you for your takeaway, given that we have in this room, everybody wants to go home with a sense of a positive shared narrative, but not a Pollyanna-ish one, not a, oh, technology will solve everything. I think if there's one message that's come out of the discussions on the last day and a half, it's, it's that technology is posing as many challenges and fears as it is opportunity and hope. So the point of this last session is really to think about what is it that will take us forward to reap the opportunities whilst dealing with some of the fears. So Tim, your message has been that we've got to pay attention not just to te technology, but to the societies which are using technology and the fact that they're very fractured. What's, th what's the takeaway you would want everybody to take out back to their own workplace and community on that? So three very quick takeouts. One is um, people need a sense of agency. So this discussion about co-creation, about technology, the, the neuroscience, Critical to that is give people control. Um, and I think that runs across technology and governance systems, et cetera. Um, second point is on, uh, we need to design technology that's human-centered and that brings people together. So the algorithms for our social media, for Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, we need to bring more public scrutiny. We need to bring people together. We need to find solutions because they need to change, because they're harming us. Listen to what Sean Parker, the founding president of Facebook, said just the other day, that they are built on the manipulation of weaknesses in human psychology. But we can positively shift that, working with those companies. Third takeout, a very practical suggestion that came from the Agile governance discussions, is developing a global network of exchanging experience and learning from measures to create connection between people who are separated. Um, we have in our cities, as growing urbanization, we are actually seeing in, in many cities around the world increasing segregation of people. 
fewer people who are unlike each other connecting, even though they're in diverse communities. We need to find practical solutions, housing, education, uh, workplaces that bring different people together. And we need to very quickly find scalable ways to do that more because that's actually at the heart of building strong, resilient, cohesive societies. Thank you. Um, Nita, you've kicked us off getting with Worry. your fearful right. story right. about people um, peering into our brains. So I, but what's the, yeah, what's so, the... So, I mean, I, I give those examples not because I think we should fear technology, mm -hmm. um, but we should recognize that um, it's essential that we engage in a conversation uh, between the public and governments on how to ensure a minimum level of protection. And so I, you mentioned SciPol that we've launched um, through the Duke Initiative for Science and Society. That's trying to create uh, transparency for individuals about science policy, but also create opportunities for engagement for this kind of co-creation, a way for people to know how do you find opportunities for engagement in science policy? How do you influence the outcome? which means um, it's trying to build upon uh, a move toward deliberative democracy, toward a recognition that the best way for us to have models that protect us, models that ensure that we can reap the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution, is if we engage stakeholders, which is all of us, which is everybody in society who is going to be impacted in technology, in building toward a future, in building toward what I think is a minimum level of protection. So I think governments play an essential role in this to ensure and help us adopt a minimum level of protection so that individuals can reap the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution because we're enjoying the benefits but we're entering into a period of great risk to individual liberty, to individual autonomy, to individual ability to participate in society fully, to enjoy those benefits without having serious repercussions. And so I think we need to um, encourage people to engage in a process of deliberative democracy so that governments can know what the minimum level of protection is to ensure that we can participate and fully enjoy those benefits. Thank you. So deliberation and dialogue sound polite. But of course, some of these issues are going to bring people into really serious conflict. And those conflicts will also be between states and across governments. So um, that's presumably where we need institutions for cooperation so that, so that the conflict can be moderated and brought down into some compromises. Is, is what, what's the lesson that we should learn from the NDB, um, Leslie? Two brief uh, takeaways uh, from here. I quite like the idea of, uh, I think it was called multi-generational uh, design, if we can incorporate that principle in uh, um, our work. The, the, the key takeaway that I would like to leave everyone with is that the search is still going on for how institutions and global institutions need to adapt to this new uh, world. Someone in our Council on uh, Long-Term Investment and Infrastructure came up with the idea of youth advisory councils. Just for a moment, contemplate the idea that all of us, whether it's the World Bank, New Development Bank, all of these global institutions have a youth advisory council and, and have a much more open sort of model to tap into uh, the ideas of, of this uh, next generation. The second uh, uh, takeaway that I'd like to sort of leave everyone with is, there is as part of the search, this idea of what radical transparency will mean in the future for institutions is something worth, worth uh, thinking about. At the moment, it is very, done in a very contained manner where we consult with civil society organizations, we consult with uh, stakeholders, and it's called stakeholder dialogue, etc. But the idea of opening up and having everything in the public domain, if you are an instrument of public policy like a World Bank or a New Development Bank or AIIB, why should your board meetings not all be sort of public? You ultimately spend taxpayers' money. Everyone here have a right to know what we actually do. The key point is new models of governance. There is still a search going on. We are still, it's still elusive right now, but there are several experiments underway. Great. Thank you. Radical transparency. Uh, Nina? Well, I'd say I just hope people go away with the idea that also communication depends on how you're explaining a lot of these ideas to people. Quite often the reporter that's interviewing you isn't an expert in the field, so make sure that you're explaining the idea properly and speaking ordinary people's words. And also, you know, we use um, words like mobility, people's mobility, whereas we're in a region and, and we're witnessing a time in the world where you have about 60 million people between refugees and those who are displaced, or more than 60 million people. And so 
for them it's not about mobility, it's about displacement and having documents that prove who they are and finding how they're going to have their next meal come or what country will keep them there or not. So I think we really have to also be grounded. And that's to say it's a shared narrative where we have a shared future together. And even if it's not positive, many of us in this room are privileged enough to have tools to change that. So lots of ideas. I think one thing that has come through very clearly is the give people back control, co-creation, how you engage people, not just in a dialogue, but in really feeling that they are part of controlling the development of the technology and its, its regulation afterwards. There's been an undercurrent of what we do with technology companies as they transition into becoming effective publishers and how, how we move with technology companies. I think there's a consensus that something has to change there um, and, there's, and, what, what, and those changes need to be taken forward as a, as a sense of urgency because as Tim reminded us, technology in its disruptive form is disrupting societies that are already very disrupted. And the communications technologies, we really need to think about that because we need cohesive societies to govern the technologies to be used to their best effect. Radical transparency, um, Leslie um, proposed to us. And then I think common to all of these thinking and to the WEF's thinking is the idea that if we Think about Vision 2030. If we put the timeline up, this goes to the multi-generational issue, perhaps it's easier than thinking about what we do next year. It's not kicking the can down the road. It's just saying perhaps if we're going to co-create something, if we're going to try to come to agreement, the easiest way to do that is to start with a vision of what this should look like in 2030 and then move back. And I know I probably speak to everyone and saying I hope that in the work that you've done in the last day and a half, you've managed to get a handle on that and think about what 2030 should look like so that we can all go away and start working backwards from that on the steps we need towards what this session was about, a shared narrative. Thank you all hugely for participating. It's, uh, I think it's lunchtime, so thank you. Thanks to the speakers. Thank you.